So this is a place where your fellow Biola students are going to share a Snapchat of yeah. their stories. So we do this as a way to start conversations and celebrate the diversity within our student body. So these Image of God segments kind of invite us as a community to practice humility and also hospitality and embrace our differences because we're united in Christ. This time is so valuable because something really beautiful happens when we hear people's stories. We get a glimpse of God's intent for his kingdom, a kingdom that is comprised of diverse perspectives, backgrounds, giftings, ethnicities, and abilities. I also like to think of stories as kind of a worship experience because they're glorifying to God. Our lives are testimonies to his goodness. And as we're listening to the work that God does in other people's lives, we are reminded that he holds all of us in the palm of his hand and that he's moving and he's redeeming. So today we're inviting people from our community who are student athletes. As you know, well some of you know, we're transitioning into the NCAA, so that's exciting. And today, yeah, we wanted to highlight what God's been doing in these student lives as they've been involved in athletics here at Biola. So we have four students sharing with us today. And first we have Christina, who's on our women's soccer team. We have Ange, who's on our baseball team. Yeah. Emma, who's on our <laughs> women's basketball team. And Spencer, who's on our men's soccer team. There it is. <laughs> so together we're gonna celebrate that they are part of our families and that their stories are part of our stories and that they are made in the image of God. So please welcome up Christina. Hi, I'm, my name is Christina Rodriguez and I am made in the image of God. I'm a sophomore here and my major is sociology, emphasis on social work and I am one of the goalkeepers on the women's soccer team here. I've been put in sports uh, my whole life, but soccer was one that my passion lied. In high school, I ran track, uh, played soccer, and even played football. I did very well in all these sports, receiving multiple awards for my accomplishments and even being named Athlete of the Year my senior year. Playing soccer since I was five, really put most of my identity in the sport and most of my confidence. Um, it literally was my whole life and what my life consisted of every day. Um, but it had pushed me to be the person I am today and pushed me as an athlete and what I'm capable of all. But at the time, I felt that soccer was all that I could do in life and nothing more. Throughout soccer, I have always done well in my performances and always started on the field. People and myself always expected me to do great things in college, uh, which made me feel like I had to live up to a lot of expectations. But when I first attended my first college, I did not go, it did not go as I hoped. Uh, I did not start when I came on the team, but I had to redshirt, which means I would not be able to play that year and but still had another eligibility to play. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> During this time, I was very unhappy that soccer was not working out as I had hoped and that school was not even great either. When people would ask me about soccer, I would feel embarrassed at times telling them that I was redshirting. It confused me why I even was attending that school and what my purpose there was. I was not angry with God, but I was confused and definitely question why this had happened. After all these years of playing and missing out on important events in my life, to play for a school that did not necessarily care to win was frustrating because I knew that there was nothing I could do about it. However, my dad had told me that I could choose two ways to go about this situation of me not playing. Either I could have a bad attitude and, bad attitude and make it worse for myself or to have a good attitude and take as much experience as I could from the team and from soccer. I cho chose to look on the bright side of it and even if I wasn't not playing, I knew that cheering for my teammates was just as important as playing. Through this time, I had <clears throat> it had taught me how to be humble and have a good attitude when something does not go my way. I am no longer ashamed of telling people that I had redshirted because to me, it was a learning experience I needed to happen in my life. 
I realize that uh, life is competitive and sometimes things will not always go as the way you want it to. It's not always easy for me, but by leaning on God for support, it helped me get through it all. He then gave me the opportunity to transfer to Biola and be part of a great team, which is kind of funny because when I was first actually looking at Biola, I didn't really want to go here because my sister had attended and played here for all her four years. Um, but here I was now basically asking God and praying to him with all my might that I could be part of this amazing team. Uh, I am so happy. <laughs> I am so happy and honored to be playing with an amazing group of women, who encourage my, me and each other uh, to be better Christians and how to act Christ-like. Our team is very competitive and always has the will to win. But more, more importantly, we make sure our team is very. Uh, our team foundation is based on God. We make it a point on the field that we are to show God's love on, in multiple ways. In some ways, we try not to retaliate against the other team <laughs> or uh, argue with the ref. <laughs> and at the end of every game, we give out Gatorades to the other team. We know that the jersey we wear is more than just a number. It is a rep representation we hold for ourselves as a player as a student and as a Christian. Though sometimes this may not be the easiest, we know that this is what it truly means to play for him. Giving all the glory to him, win or lose, and knowing that our abilities come from him and are meant to serve him. I realize now that my identity is not solely based on soccer uh, so much. Thankful for the, I am very thankful for what had happened to me at my other school because without it, I would have not been here. And I've grown so much being at Biola and as a Christian, I'm very thankful for that. Um, I just had to trust in God and know that everything does work out and that my identity as a soccer player, I know will not last forever, but my identity as a Christian does. He's the only reason why I'm here today and I hope that in my abilities that I can show his love onto others. My name is Christina and I am made in the image of God. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
So, so one of the things that, that we're here to talk about is how our sport and faith coincide. And, and so baseball and life have so many, so many great similarities. Uh, baseball is such a game of failure. And in life, I think we all know that we fail all the time. Um, yet in baseball, you just have to continue to be confident and just trust the process. That's a huge buzzword within baseball is trust the process. And honestly, that comes from the Bible. It comes from Galatians chapter 6. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Which I think is kind of cool. God is not mocked. Uh, whatever a man sows, he will also reap. So therefore, do not grow weary of doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest of eternal life. And, and so as, as I'm reading that and, and thinking about baseball, right, um, I remember at the Tory conference, the, the lady who played softball here, she talked about how, how she like figured out the math that she had to do eight hours of pitching work a week and, in order to get better as a pitcher. And so when, when she would do that, it didn't guarantee her success, but if she didn't do that, she had no chance of growing. And so in, in thinking about that um, in baseball, like, like, like going and hitting early doesn't guarantee your success. Going and taking extra ground balls, taking extra fly balls, getting your lifts in, like that doesn't guarantee you success, but it get, it, like, that's the only chance that you have to grow. If you don't do that stuff, then, then you can't grow. And so it's the same way in our spiritual lives, like praying, reading the Bible, having time of solitude, like that stuff, it doesn't guarantee you growth, but without that, you, you cannot grow. And so I think that's, that's something that, that baseball has taught me, um, the discipline of being able to, even when I don't feel like praying, even when I don't feel like reading my Bible or spending time alone with God, to just trust that if I do that, then God is gonna move in my life. Um, that at the proper time you will reap a harvest of eternal life. Um, so I think that's just one lesson that baseball has taught me that has just um, bear, bear, bore so much fruit. Uh, I don't know how to say that. But, but then another thing um, that our coach, he, his name is Coach Solinger, he's a total stud. And, and he, one of the things that, that we do every year is we do this thing called flyball communication. And so basically, right, you have the defense, and then, and then you have the infielders and the outfielders, and our coach will intentionally hit a pop-up right in between to try to get us to mess up, because, um, because those are gonna happen in the game. And if we can't do it in practice, then we won't be able to do it in the game. And so he intentionally hits balls right in that middle so that we have to communicate with the outfielders um, on who's gonna catch the ball, and um, so that we don't run into each other and hurt each other. But, but one of the things that he always says is that that faith without works is dead. Faith without action is dead. And that faith is actually a verb. It's, it's, an, it's an action word. And, and so he, he talks about two things um, that like indicate whether you actually have faith that you're gonna catch the ball. And the first thing is your voice, whether you're convicted in, in like actually calling for the ball or if you're just silent. Um, and then the other thing is your action through your body language. And so, um, so one of the biggest indicators that you don't believe that you're going to catch the fly ball is if you're if is if you're running and you look at the other person, because if you look at the other person, you're taking your eyes off the ball, and you don't trust that you're actually going to catch it. And so I think that goes right in right in with how um, how Jesus calls us to love one another, right? How he calls us to esteem one another as higher than ourselves. A lot of times we're running for the ball and we know we know that we're supposed to catch this ball, and we're like, yeah, I can catch this but we don't trust, and we look at the other person. And so we look at this person next to us, and we're like, hey, uh, do you want to catch the ball? Do you want to esteem this person as higher than yourself? Because I, I could, but I don't, I don't trust it. So, so yeah, those are just a couple things that baseball has taught me um, and that has helped grow my faith in Christ. So my name is Andrew Joie, and I'm made in the image of God. Thank you. Good morning. These lights are so bright, I, I can't see anybody, so that helps. Um, <laughs> um, my name is Emma Newman, and I'm made in the image of God. Um, I am 
on the women's basketball team. I'm a junior, and I'm a biology major. Um, when I thought about what my college basketball career would look like, I thought it would include like having a great season, having great stats. Personally, I wanted to win a lot of awards, um, and none of these desires are bad in themselves. Um, but what my college basketball career has been so far is marked by a lot more bench time than court time because of injuries. Uh, so it's been humbling. Um, at the beginning of my sophomore season, I was coming off of an injury that cut my freshman season in half, and I was playing the best I'd ever played. And I was so excited because I was like, okay, God, this is it. This is my season that I'm gonna do really well and like actually get to play and make an impact on this team. Um, <clears throat> but then, in our sixth game of the season, towards the end of the game, I tore my ACL. And um, after that game in our locker room, my coach had everyone lay their hands on me and he prayed over me. And there was one part of his prayer that just has stuck with me uh, till today. And he prayed, God, I pray that you would help Emma thank you for this injury. And when he said that, I thought, are you kidding me? <laughs> like right now? Um, but that's okay because I didn't think at the time that I'd be able to thank God for what had just happened, and I didn't want to thank him for what had just happened because my season was over. Um, but over time, God humbled me and allowed me to, to, to be able to thank him for it because in it he's reminded me that my most important identity is not as a basketball player, but as his child, as his daughter, made in his image. Um, so after I had surgery, I was on my crutches, hanging out in the corner of the gym after one of our games later that season. And everybody on my team was talking to their family or friends in the stands, and I was just in the corner waiting for everybody to gather up and go to the post-game meeting. And my coach's wife came up to me, and she asked me how I was doing, and I was like, eh, you know, I'm doing all right, uh, but this has been hard, it's been really humbling. And she proceeded to share with me a story, and it's about a shepherd and his sheep, and one of the sheep in the flock began to wander off from the shepherd. And as the sheep continued to wander, the shepherd was following and following, and then at one point, the shepherd just picked up the sheep and broke its leg. And the sheep stayed with the shepherd in his arms until it was fully healed. So after she told me this story, I thought, uh, is she calling me this sheep that's strayed away <laughs> from the Lord? And in my pride, I was like, hmm, Okay, you know, I'll, I'll take that and think about it. Um, so obviously the story is not identical. God did not, you know, break my leg, tear my ACL. It just happened. But uh, as I thought about it, I, I saw that, okay, yeah, I definitely was straying from the Lord. I was wandering, chasing this identity as a basketball player and valuing it so much more than the identity that he's given me in him, um, being made in his image. So, in summary, my journey as a college athlete has not been all that I dreamt it would be, but it's been so much more and in such a different way. Uh, God has graciously been in pursuit of my heart the entire time. Um, he has followed me as I wandered off. He humbled me, allowing me to return to him, and he continues to do so every day because I still wander off. Um, and he reminded me that my identity in him, being made in his image, is more valuable than any identity that this world has to offer. Uh, so just a reminder to you and a reminder to me that he is jealous for us, he is good, and he follows us even when we wander. Um, I'm Emma Newman, and I'm made in the image of God. Thank you. I am Spencer Santos, and I am made in the image of God. This is a bit of a story about me at Biola. I'm a senior. I've been here for four, three and a half years. This is my fourth season. Um, so I walked onto the Biola soccer team. I came from a high school of less than 100. I was a big fish in a little pond. And as soon as I got here, I realized, oh no. I, I am a small fish in a very big pond. <laughs> and as I came into Biola, and I re recognized that recognize that. I had to come to God and say, look, I'm not going to make this team because of my skills. 
so I guess I want you to use me. And I said that, and I didn't really realize what I was asking. Um, so as I moved onto the team and felt that I was doing things and doing well, turns out I really wasn't. Um, one of the seniors at that time, he used to tell me, you are the worst Biola soccer player I've ever seen. <laughs> Thank you, Sava. And um, I, I learned how to, to fight and grow, and I sat on the bench. And I actually ended up registering that freshman year. Um, second year, we, as a team, did very well. We won the, the GSEC tournament. We beat Vanguard. And I don't know if any of you guys were there. Some of the upperclassmen may have been when everybody rushed the field and there was just a huge amount of energy and, and happiness and just loud and invigorating. And I hadn't played a minute that season. And moving into this year, we're NCAA and we're fighting hard and wins and losses. We're at 50, 500 right now, like exactly. And I've sat the bench. I think I've played 10 minutes. Now, please don't hear that I'm asking for pity, no. I'm saying that God has used me in other ways. I've practiced with the team day in, day out for the past four years, putting my heart in the field, knowing that I may never actually get significant minutes in conference play. Um, but I've had to put in the extra time to stay maintaining my skills, to be challenging the guys in front of me, to be pushing them to be the best that they can be, and to prove Sava wrong when he said, you're the worst pilot player. But with that has also been various injuries, minor things that have kept me from being able to do as well as I would have liked. But I've continued to grow in my love for my teammates and my desire to compete and practice. But I realize that my role on the team is not on the pitch, but behind the bench, being the 12th man, as I like to say. I am the loudest guy on the bench. I will be there for every one of our goals, every one of our losses, everything. I am the loudest, most invigorated, most dedicated to this team. But my role is also in the quiet after a loss. When the guys are emotionally struggling, I can be there. I can stretch them. I can help them. And in the grind of practice, I can be the guy that says, yeah, we just lost a game yesterday. So what? Let's put everything we have onto the field. Let's compete. Let's try. Let's push hard. Um, a verse that has been significant to me in, in this time, of these, these three and a half years, has been James 2.1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, that the testing of your faith may produce perseverance. Let perseverance finish in work in you, that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. I've had to learn how to be mature in training when I have to grow my skills and grow in character to be able to push those guys around me. I've had to learn how to be mature in games, that as much as I dearly want to compete and I dearly want to play, to lay that aside and say, no, I'm going to encourage the guy ahead of me. And I'm going to support them in the victories, but more importantly, in the defeats. Um, and I can be caring for them in all these different ways. The relationships that I've built, I've had to learn how to grow in them as I, as I think about, oh, that guy's better than me. I'm, I'm better than this guy. Putting those things aside and learning to love them where they're at. Um, and in, in some senses, understanding that is a role that I've taken on in the microcosm of the church that, this, that the men's soccer team is. But I think probably the most important place that I've had to learn maturity is in trusting that this, being on the men's soccer team, has been the place that God has put me. Um, I think the phrase that I've come to understand is that I need to lay down my desire to be great in my own eyes and in the eyes of those around me. Um, in many ways, I've had to fight the desire to leave the team because I haven't seen the results I want to see. Um, and I guess you could say in a lot of ways that's a maturity and identity. Seeing that my value is not in soccer, but that in Christ's love for me in all things, including my ability in soccer. And instead, finding the motivation to be on this team and to be caring for those around me um, because of the tasks that God has sent before me on this team. And I have to choose to lay down my pride every day. And in, in strong moments, I'm able to do that. And I have to build habits that in my weakest moments, I'm able to continue in that. But I've begun to see the profit and the value of what I've been doing as I, I'm a leader on this team and I get to be influential to the, to the younger guys to come alongside and say, hey, I see you're not getting very many minutes. 
Let's talk about that. Or, yeah, we just lost and you made the final mistake. Let's talk about that. How do we care for them? I could not have walked this road alone. Um, the, st the support and steadfastness of my brothers on the team has been monumental. And there's been so many others that have come alongside me in my weakest moments to support me. So this is not something that I've done on my own. I'm Spencer Santos, and I'm made in the image of God. Yeah, let's thank them one more time. That was so good. Wow. You guys are amazing speakers and really engaging, so thank you so much. Um, <laughs> I think an emerging theme that I saw um, in all these stories is identity, and that's kind of, I think, what this chapel ultimately comes down to. Um, worth and athletic ability, but learning to not put our worth completely in our abilities, but in Christ and remember that we're rooted and grounded in his love. So I just want to give you guys some space right now to kind of process with God a little bit about maybe the things that you find your worth in. That could be grades, athletic ability, music ability, career or job or calling, um, maybe relationship status or being that busy person. I feel like that's really common at Biola to be the one that's involved in everything and having our worth be in all the things that we're doing and we're involved in. So um, let's just take about like 30 seconds of silence. I think it's really healthy to kind of be uncomfortable in silence and um, reflect on just some of the things that we struggle with to, to kind of, we cling to um, in order to find our worth and our purpose. So take a couple minutes to do that. So this morning as I was getting ready um, for this chapel, I found myself kind of getting into this thought process that I haven't been in for a while, probably since high school. But in high school, I was, I would always struggle with the fact that I didn't have a thing that was like my thing that I was really good at. I had different things that I was pretty good at, but I felt like everyone around me was, oh, they're the really good violinist, they're the really good water polo player, they're the really good person at science or physics or theater or whatever. And this morning, I, I found myself thinking, gosh, why didn't I just stick with something? Why didn't I just commit when I was a little kid? Why didn't my parents make me continue doing swim lessons or piano so I could have had my one thing that I was an expert at, that I was awesome at? And as they were sharing, God brought that thought to my mind. It was so like fleeting and quick that I didn't even pay attention to it, but the Lord was putting it on my heart like, hey, pay attention to that. That's not who I've made you to be, that's not what I'm calling you to be, is the best at something. And um, I think that's just a super blatant example of how the narrative of the world that is telling us about finding our identities in the things of the world is permeating our hearts and affecting how we think about ourselves. The message that our worth and purpose and joy is tied to what we do is a lie. And our worth and purpose and joy is tied to what God does, not what we do. God has given every one of you unique abilities and talents and gifts, and those are good things, but they aren't all that we are. At the end of the day, we are first and foremost God's children, kingdom workers and image bears. Hopefully this time has been encouraging for you guys. I know God was really <laughs> ministering to me through it. Um, I hope that he's reminded you that your worth is in him and that he's up to something and he's doing things and he's working. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.